Hi, welcome back to another episode of Digging for Truth. The last 200 years in Western society and academia, there have been claims in liberal and critical scholarship that the person of Moses didn't exist or that he didn't write the five books that are found in the Old Testament, the first five books. To some of you watching the program, this might be an incredible claim who go to church every week and say, well, I read about Moses, I believe that Moses existed. But this scholarship that's prevailed in the last two centuries has had a deep impact on people's trust in the Bible. We're going to explore this question today in this attempt to erase Moses. And we have a special guest that's joining us today to do just that. Her name is Kristen Davis. She's the assistant professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University and the founder of a great apologetics ministry called Doubtless Faith. Kristen, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here today. Hey, thank you. It's well, you're, to be here. you're welcome. And uh, we're, we're, we're so excited to have you on the program. Now, in my introduction, I introduced something that might be strange to people, the idea of erasing Moses. But actually, you and I and many others who are involved in scholarship related to the Bible know all about this. Um, and so you are going to help us explore this question today. We're going to do this together, and we're going to help, help equip the church to, to understand the problems with this theory. Now, um, my first question to start off, um, there is a, a hypothesis that was developed in the 19th century mainly. Uh, it has precursors before that. It's called the documentary hypothesis. And now that's kind of a mouthful for people, but, but it's an important theory that has impacted the West very seriously. Why don't you go ahead and get started with that and tell us a little bit about what's called the documentary hypothesis. Yeah, um, so the documentary hypothesis was founded roughly um, in the late 1800s, about 1899, Julius Wellhausen pro published his promulg Prolegomena to the History of Ancient Israel. And essentially in this work, he proposes the documentary hypothesis. Some people might um, be more familiar with the term the JEPD theory. And essentially what this theory promotes is the idea that instead of having five uh, linear books to the Pentateuch, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, instead of that, what we have actually is three, anywhere from three to seven underlying sources that thread their way through these five books and were by five different authors. And so what it does is it ends up dissecting the bib or early bi biblical history in such a way as to kind of deconstruct the theological heart of the Pentateuch. And so um, depending on who is promoting the theory, because there's been lots of advances in that since Wellhausen published his original work in 1899, um, he went with three primary sources, Jehovah, Elohim, and, and Deuteronomy. And the way he spliced this up is that he believed that wherever we saw the name Jehovah in the Pentateuch, that that was one source. Wherever we saw the name Elohim in the Pentateuch, that came from another source. And then any yes. of the very sophisticated laws or rituals that we see in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, that those were an alternative source that wasn't created until um, the post-exilic period. Okay, that, that's, a really good, that's a really good summary. So these indicators in the text, the name of God particularly, and the Levitical law, were indicators to Wellhausen and those who sort of follow the the general framework of this. It's changed a lot, but the, the basic yeah. idea is still there, right? Yes. Uh, 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 they, they theorized uh, in a very complex way that uh, ah, we don't need this Moses guy. Uh, these are different authors writing and different time periods. Is that, is that correct? Maybe you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So they end up dividing it up and they, uh, Wellhausen believes that there are three main points or parts to Israelite history, he, uh, religious history that parallels their socio-political history. Um, and so during the what we would consider the patriarchal period, where it's more tribal, Abraham, his sons, and then later the 12 tribes, um, he considers that a very free form religion with a lot of flexibility. People could worship wherever they wanted. They could do whatever they wanted. There was no rules associated with this, and they had no place that they needed to go. Um, he then sees this progressing um, at a later point in time, when David becomes the monarch, he thinks that because they've added this king, now David's trying to legitimize his reign. And so as a result of this, he starts to try and centralize 
uh, religious worship under himself. And so there's the building of the temple under his son Solomon, and then there is the creation of the priests, and they bring all of the feasts and festivals into the city, not because they're trying to force the people to abandon their ex- uh, worship in other places, but mostly because he, uh, he wants to give them the sense of pomp and circumstance yeah. Um, by legitimate, legitimizing his reign through the through the practice of religion. So what I hear you saying, Kristen, in a way, is what Wellhausen and others see for the period of David forward, in a sense, if I could, I'm, simplif- I'm, I'm oversimplifying when I say this, is it's a piece of propaganda, in a, in a, yeah. in a, in a sense, right? Yeah, they don't go uh, that far, not all of them at least, don't go that far with their language, but essentially that is kind of the underlying message, is that um, the final phase is mostly uh, very propaganda-oriented in the sense that Wellhausen believes that after the northern kingdoms uh, fall in the Assyrian invasion, that actually what happens is now the religious leaders have gained enough um, clout and support, and now the geographic land has shrunk enough that now that they can start enforcing all of these rules that we see in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. So he thinks that part of the strictness of the religion is developed after the geography of Israel is shrunk, as well as there's a lot of fear that's now been created in the people. So they have uh, the power now to push religion in the direction that they would, would like it to go. Well, uh, to say the least, there's a lot of uh... Uh, presuppositions and assumptions built into this theory. We're going to explore a little bit of that as we go through it. Let, let's. Uh, we have about a minute left in this segment. One item okay. that you that you note that was sort of a red flag for people was the recording of Moses' death. Could you just talk about that a little bit as just a little tidbit of something that people found problematic with us saying that Moses wrote the Pentateuch? Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that was raised prior to Wellhausen in a couple different individuals was that Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible are entirely credited to Moses. And therefore, if Moses' death is spoken of at the end of Deuteronomy, there's no way that he could have written about that. And so there were people who had lots of problems with um, believing in the history of those books because they believed that um, this kind of revelation wasn't po- or this kind of communication wasn't possible and so there was kind of like a um legalism in the authorship of the Pentateuch, which I found really interesting because in my exploration, every time Moses or is mentioned throughout the remainder of scripture, it's always talking about the law. So it doesn't explicitly outline that Moses wrote all of the first five books, every single word. Yes. It, it, it explicitly states that the law is what's attributed to Moses. Now, that doesn't mean that Moses didn't collect everything else and and put all of the rest of the Pentateuch together, but there's nothing in Scripture that would be in contradiction with Moses not writing the chapters about his own death. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. That's a, that's a good insight. Okay, folks, uh, we're talking about uh, attempts to erase Moses from history, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're exploring the question of the existence of Moses and his authorship of the first five books of the Bible with Kristen Davis, who's the uh, uh, pro- assistant professor, excuse me, of apologetics at Houston Baptist University and founder of Doubtless Faith Ministries. All right, so we were talking about Julius Wellhausen um, and his sort of, he's the one that really solidified this idea. There were precursors to it in the earlier period, but it was Wellhausen was sort of the man on this. Um, let's talk about uh, the, a fundamental question, that, which you've explored uh, intensively and extensively. What is it that drove Wellhausen to come up with this theory? What, what, what were his underlying assumptions, motivations that you can tell in deconstructing Moses, if you will? 
Okay. Yeah. So Wellhausen gives credit for his theory or at least the underlying foundation of his theory to Carl Graf and Willem Vetke, um, who were the original um, or Carl Graf would be the original idea person who came up with the idea that you should swap the history of the Pentateuch with that of the period of the prophets and the kings. And so Wellhausen found this really, really attractive because he had a preference for a particular point in his in the history of Israel. He, um, in the beginning of his manuscript, actually on like just the third page at the very beginning, he goes so far as to say that his favorite parts of scripture were the kings and the prophets and that he was extensively familiar with um, and he had not actually read the Pentateuch or the law. And so someone told him that Really, he had started more with the roof than the foundation, and he needed to go back and read the law so that he could understand the foundation of yeah. these er times. Um, and so from that, he went and did so, and he comes to the conclusion that reading the law actually marred his view of the kings and prophets. He no longer liked them in the same way he had before. And so he was really upset by this and um, went exploring and ended up coming to the king to Karl Graf's um, work, where Karl Graf said that he put the Deuteronomy and Levitical por portions of the Pentateuch after the period of the Kings and the Prophets. And Wellhausen says, almost without knowing Graf's reason for the hypothesis, I was prepared to accept it. And so he, he pretty much admits that his motivation is not necessarily scholarly. It's all based upon his personal preference for this particular period in history. Yeah, that, you know, that's, that's quite incredible when we look back at the influence that this theory has had. On, on biblical scholarship and that that in your investigation uh, that there's such a dimension of this personal bias, if you will. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it was malicious, but it's just right. this, this is a preference that he has. Let's explore that a little bit more because, boy, that really undergirds the whole idea, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, so Wellhausen had a pretty strong motivation for this, but he's not the first person who seems to play out religious history in this way. Um, when I was doing my research of Wellhausen, I noticed that he seems to have a lot of similar underlying assumptions as E.B. Tyler. E.B. Tyler was a contemporary of Wellhausen, and he um, promoted the idea of the evolutionary theory of religion. And that essentially yeah. created this overarching view of religion that said that the way religion looked at a period of time was based upon the way the people of that religion viewed their deity. And so as the people were tribal, they were very close with, or sorry, not their deity, viewed their leader. And so as the people of a tribe were very close to their leader, they their deity was very close and personal. And then as this um, political leader became more and more abstract through kingdoms and then eventually empires, their God became more distant and more unrelatable until we eventually get monotheism. Wellhausen accepts this view. Um, yeah. Graf, or, um, Tyler does it mostly out of his uh, preferential view for modern culture. Modern for him would have been the 1800s. And he saw that thought religion evolved up to this kind of post-religious period uh, when he was alive. Wellhausen accepts that same idea and views a religious progression, though, of course, he doesn't go quite as far as Tyler because he's looking at a much smaller point in history. Yeah. Yeah, that, you know, that's very helpful because I think it helps us get at, we talk about in our show all the time, evidence, right? We've got lots of evidence, archaeology, history, science, all that kind of stuff. But then you've got worldview presuppositions that sort of undergird, and they work in, in concert with one another. Um, what, what I, you know, it's interesting, the, biblical, the overall biblical view of, of history is that it began with monotheism and was per perverted into paganism as a result of the fall and idolatry. So here we have two worldview paradigms, really, if we take the Bible at face value, that clash with one another. Well, and the interesting thing that you bring that up is that's actually how Tyler's theory was refuted. Tyler saw his theory refuted in his own lifetime, um, even before Wellhausen published his record, because studies were done of tribal people groups that were considered to be the most primitive, according to Tyler. Um, if you were to go to um, a, an unreached people group in a tribe in Africa or Australia and you were to look at their religion, he expected to see a very animistic religion. And instead, when we actually go look at the evidence for those places, we find that those are monotheistic peoples oftentimes. And so that's how um, Tyler was, his theory was actually refuted during his own lifetime. Well, that's interesting. So you're talking about people who live what we consider to be 
quote unquote primitive culture. In other words, they don't have all the modern uh, conveniences. They live a very basic lifestyle, but they found monotheism. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and so that under, undermined the whole the whole idea. Now, how much in how much in your view? You got about a minute in this segment. Would you say that that really causes Wellhausen's ideas to collapse? How dependent is he on this in your in your estimation? So that was my um, my that is my focus of study going forward. Is um, I think that Wellhausen has a lot of ideas that are dependent upon Tyler's same presuppositions. We covered a few of them. Um, yeah. But I think that Wellhausen should have not been as successful as he was. His ideas should not have taken root, given the fact that. Uh, Tyler's did not take root. And so my current exploration in terms of research is what was going on in the water? What are the philosophical ideas that were floating around at the late 1800s, early 1900s that allowed this to um, take root and just kind of spread like wildfire? Because even now it's one of the, uh, it's, it's being taught in some of the most conservative Christian universities as well. Yeah, uh, we, we've seen a disturbing trend of, of at first, uh, conservatives fought against this vociferously, if I could say that. I mean, very strong reaction from conservative. Uh, I mean, I've read stuff from William Henry Green from Princeton. He, he just tried to uh, go against this with the force of his intellect. But now we see a little bit of a problem in what we consider to be conservative circles, accepting some of these presuppositions. And uh, let's, let's uh, take a pause right now because we're going to come up on a break. We'll pick up with that thought in our next segment. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're exploring the question about the authorship of the first five books of the Bible. Uh, the church has historically said, and the Bible itself says, that Moses wrote these books. But uh, there's been a movement in the last couple of centuries in Western society and uh, academia in particular that says that Moses didn't exist. And if he did, uh, he, he's not responsible for the Pentateuch, but numerous authors are. We've been exploring that question with Kristen Davis, uh, who's the assistant professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University. Um, Kristen, now, uh, let's, let's talk a little bit further now. We've, we've, we've kind of gone into, you know, some depths here a little bit, but I think out of necessity, um, I think it's important uh, that the audience understand the, some of the philosophical stuff. Uh, it's happening now in different ways and different subjects that influences scholarship. Um, maybe you could talk about a couple of the other influences of the time that you think just instantly caused this to be accepted in academia. Yeah, so this is um, a research project that is still ongoing for me at the time. Um, but some of the things that I'm exploring right now are ideas, some of uh, Kant's ideas, Immanuel Kant, as well as um, Hegel. He was, the, both of these were individuals that had a lot of influence on thought during this period of time and a lot of uh, deconstruction of um, historical paradigms. And so what, some of the things that we see with Hegel is that he has a very um, kind of almost evolutionary view. And I see, use evolution very loosely in this way. Um, but he has almost a very evolutionary view of history in general. Um, he, this is not in the sense of Darwinian evolution, but he thinks that there is this kind of one that as we look at the historical paradigm and as we look at reality kind of unfolds itself, unfolds itself more and more throughout history. And so this is something I'm exploring right now. Um, and I think all of these probably played into why this was so attractive at the time. I think there's a lot of shared assumptions between this view as, and Darwinian evolution. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we want to encourage our audience to pray for Kristen because she's in her PhD studies 
and it's deep stuff, but, but it's important work that she's doing. And so we ask you to, pr to pray for her as she continues to work on this, because the church needs this kind of work to be done. Uh, we want to we want to come up with some uh, we want to come up with an alternative, a better alternative, and a more coherent answer to this. And so uh, let's talk a little bit about Chris, Kristen. Where where do we go from here um, with with this problem? This has not only dominated liberal critical scholarship, but now it's it's it, it's it's in the conservative literature on the Old Testament. I mean, I'm doing research. Uh, on Genesis 5 and 11, and all the time I read what I consider to be a conservative author mentioning the sources and all this kind of thing. Uh, I know it's a kind of a mouthful of a question, but uh, wh where do we go from here and uh, what can we do to encourage the church not to uh, fall into this trap? Perhaps that would be a good question too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's interesting that you say that because yeah, I've had conversation with other conversations with other conservative professors, and I've been really surprised when I've presented some of my research, and they've said, well, you know, I, I can see what you're saying, but I just don't see a better alternative theory right now. And so they're basically kind of accept it and teach it, and they and they show some of the holes that are in it, but they teach it as though that's the reigning theory. Um, and I found that this really interesting. And so when I was actually in another class um, for my PhD, I was a philosophy of science class, I was promoted or, or introduced to this idea of paradigms. Um, JT Bridges is trying to do the same kind of thing that I would like to do with the documentary hypothesis for Darwinian evolution. And the conclusion he came to was that the neo-Darwinian intelligent design debate is actually something more of a paradigm debate in the sense that um, rather than just trying to poke holes in the given theory by showing all these data points that don't fit the current theory, what we need to do is focus on trying to create an alternative paradigm that answers the question more. So yes. in terms of philosophy of science, the way that looks is you would um, look at all the data points, figure out your assumptions, and then create a new set of of theoretical assumptions and build a different paradigm. And over time, people would find that more and more convincing and they would swap over. But that scientists don't leave paradigms, even if they think that they are bad, until they have someplace else to go. Yes. Yeah, th th you know, that's very interesting because, because we're all brought up in paradigms. We all think in terms of paradigms, worldview paradigms. And scholars do this just as much as lay people do. Regular folks, uh, you know, live in, live in their life. They actually have a paradigm. They don't think about it like we do because this is where we live. This is kind of what we do. Um, but I, I really like that idea of, hey, um, we don't think that that paradigm is correct, but we also need to positively present a paradigm that works better. And I think, I think we need to do that in a lot of areas, but maybe uh, talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. So I think that um, that's one of the things that we as a church need to be the, the frontier going forward. Uh, theologians, historians, archaeologists, pastors, everyone has done a really good job of showing how the documentary hypothesis just doesn't work, how all of these data points just do not fit into it. And I think now we need to research the underlying assumptions, which is part of what I'm working on now, uh, part of the philosophy that was going on. Also being generous to the documentary hypothesis and taking a look and saying, all right, what are the things that this theory does well yeah. so that we can figure out how we can present those in our new theory and not leave them out. Um, so it's really about kind of trying to take the time to understand what the philosophies were that were supporting the system when it took over, what are the philosophies that are going on now that make it continue to stay uh, functional, and then also what it did well so that we can try and construct something that hits all of the data points rather than just a particular subset. Yeah, that's great. Now we got about 45 seconds to wrap up the program. Now this is kind of a tough question to boil down, but for the church layman watching this program who's not involved in these kind of things, what would be your final encouragement to them uh, to, uh, as it relates to the person of Moses and the Pentateuch? What, what, are your, what are your thoughts for a regular person who goes to church who's not involved in these debates? Yeah, I would say that there is absolutely nothing in Scripture that forces us down a road that is in conflict with the current historical data and landscape. So if you look at the archaeological record, you will see that every time the Old Testament, it talks about some sort of historical detail um, it may, that can be validated in the archaeological record. It is always validated as true. It has never been overturned. 
And so I would say that that is really, really strong evidence for the reliability of the Old Testament. And so while we cannot necessar- necessarily um, validate the person of Moses, I don't think there's anything in the Pentateuch that forces us to throw it out, given the fact that, for example, Moses's death is written about in his text. So I would say yes. continue to teach this as history and continue to follow the research because every time something's uncovered, it always supports the biblical narrative. It's, it's absolutely incredible to me. Yeah, it's incredible to us too. Thank you so much, Kristen, for being on the show and sharing your research. It's important and we'll be praying for you for its success. Friends, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we encourage you to continue to believe that Moses was a prophet who wrote the first five books of the Bible and his ministry is fulfilled in the person of Jesus, the great prophet. Thank you for joining us today. 